we will begin the formal proceedings with a recitation from the Holy Quran. May I please call upon Bulbul Shah, an alumni of the IIS, originally from Chitral, to recite, and Mitra Giyami from Iran, who is also an IIS alumnus, to translate. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن آياته خلق السماوات والأرض والأرض واختلاف ألسنتكم وألوانكم إن في ذلك لآيات لآيات للعالمين ومن آياته منامكم بالليل بالليل والنهار وابتغاؤكم وابتغاؤكم من فضله ومن آياته يريكم البرق خوفا خوفا وطمعا وينزل من السماء ماء ماء فيحيي به الأرض بعد موتها إن في ذلك لآيات لقوم, لقوم يعقلون صدق الله in the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the ever merciful. Among other signs of his is the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the variety of your tongues and complexions. Verily, there are signs in there for those who understand. Another sign of his is that he made the night a time for sleep, the day for seeking his bounty. Verily, there are signs in this for those who pay heed. Another of his signs is that he makes lightning flash, which fills you both with dread and hope. And he sends down water from the sky and enlivens the earth that was dead. Verily, there are signs in this for those who have sense. Your Highness, members of the board, faculty, alumni, my lord, leaders of the International Jamaat, distinguished guests, it is indeed a pleasure and a privilege to welcome you all here to this afternoon's graduation ceremony. As you are all aware, the Institute is currently commemorating its 25th anniversary, and we are very pleased to have with us this afternoon so many people that have played a part in the creation, the development, and the continuous growth of the IIS. 25 years is a short period of time in the life of an academic institution, and yet so much can be and so much has been accomplished in this time. To tell us more about the work of the Institute and the graduate program, 
May I please call upon the director of the institute, Professor Azim Nanji. Your Highness, colleagues, students, alumni, distinguished guests. We're gathered here today to celebrate our 25th anniversary, to offer congratulations and to recognize our graduates, our alumni, their families, the faculty, the staff. Also, this occasion affords us the opportunity to thank our Board of Governors, past and present, and our many friends, supporters, and colleagues from all over the world. 25 years in the scheme of things and in the life of an institution is a very, very short time, particularly when in the United Kingdom there are universities like Cambridge and Oxford that can boast genealogies 800 years. <coughs> the institute may be 25 years, but the tradition it draws from is a thousand years old. Your Highness, a thousand years ago, your illustrious ancestor, Imam Mu'iz, established in Cairo the University of Al-Azhar. Later, in Alamut, we had a very distinguished center of learning. All these institutions represent the spirit that we try to carry on in the Institute. And just as those institutions have become part of our historical memory, so we hope that this institute, at this time, in the context of all the institutions of education that you are creating, will represent another historic moment in our history. Your Highness, your vision and generosity led to the establishment of this institute in 1977. You not only founded the institute, but you have given generously of your time and resources to foster its vision and learning. Today, scholars and students from all over the world, and I mean this in a literal sense, from Afghanistan to Zanzibar have been its beneficiaries. Scholars of the future, we hope, will write about the globalization of higher education that took place after a thousand years in the Jamaat during this period of time. Though relatively young, the Institute's character and mission have become truly international in scope. One of our major goals has been to develop an intellectually well-founded and coherent model of Islamic education for the future. To this end, as early as in 1980, we embarked on a graduate program in Islamic Studies and Education in collaboration with McGill University in Canada and the University of London. The present graduate program in Islamic Studies and Humanities, for which the students were first recruited in 1995, departs from conventional programs in several respects. Avoiding old academic divisions of subject matter into theology, law, mysticism, and the like, it treats materials of Islam in the common framework of an intellectual, social, and cultural history. Moreover, the program does not consider Islam in places other than the Middle East as being somehow peripheral or marginal to its historical profile. Another endeavor of this program is to bring into unified perspective the disciplines related to the study of historical Islam and the contemporary Muslim world. Our hope is that we have created graduates equipped with the intellectual tools and moral commitment to address the issues of their societies and indeed the world at large. The spirit of the past is very much alive at the Institute and our hope is that these students will carry that intellectual openness, that commitment to inquiry and the compassion to serve their fellow beings wherever they go. We are deeply honored 
that you have joined us today for this occasion and privileged that you have graciously agreed to address us on this occasion, Your Highness. Distinguished guests, the faculty, staff, and students of the Institute of Ismaili Studies, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me immense happiness to be present at this graduation ceremony of the program in Islamic Studies and Humanities at the Institute of Ismaili Studies. I genuinely share the joy and pride of everyone associated with this program, and particularly the graduates. Many of you, with your prior qualifications, have the capacity to pursue different paths in life. But by joining this program, you have opted to undertake a systematic study of your heritage. I hope you will feel that this choice has not been in vain and that what you have learned will be a source of inspiration and satisfaction in your life, whatever professional path you follow. The studies you have undertaken should, I believe, enable you to play a role in helping to address the issues of contemporary relevance to Muslim societies. The Muslim world today is heir to a faith and a culture that stands among the leading civilizations in the world. The revelation granted to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, opened new horizons and released new energies of mind and spirit. It became the binding force that held the Muslims together despite the far-flung lands in which they lived, the diverse languages and dialects they spoke, and the multitude of traditions, scientific, artistic, religious, and cultural, which went into the making of a distinctive ethos. This message is still potent in the Muslim world today, although it is sometimes clouded, distorted, and deformed by political interests and by struggles for power over the minds and hearts of people. There are attempts at transforming what are meant to be fluid, progressive, open-ended, intellectually informed, and spiritually inspired traditions of thought into hardened, monolithic, absolutist, and obscurantist positions. Yet there are many across the length and breadth of the Muslim world today who care for their history and heritage, who are keenly sensitive to the radically altered conditions of the modern world. They are convinced that the idea that there is some inherent permanent division between their heritage and the world of today is a profoundly mistaken idea. And that the choice it suggests between an Islamic identity on the one hand and on the other hand, full participation in the global order of today is a false choice indeed. They seek for ways in which their societies may benefit from the intellectual and material fruits of modernity while remaining true to their distinctive moral, spiritual, and cultural heritage. Yet it is not a simple matter for any human society with a concern and appreciation of its history to relate its history and its heritage to its contemporary conditions. Traditions evolve in a context, and the context always changes thus demanding a new understanding of essential principles. For us Muslims, this is one of the pressing challenges we face. In what voice or voices can the Islamic heritage speak to us afresh, a voice true to the historical experience of the Muslim world, yet at the same time relevant 
in the technically advanced but morally turbulent and uncertain world of today. One of the challenges that has concerned me over many years and which I have discussed with leading Muslim thinkers is how education for Muslims can reclaim the inherent strengths that at the height of their civilizations equipped Muslim societies to excel in diverse areas of human endeavor. Clearly, the intellectual development of the Ummah is and should remain a central goal to be pursued with urgency if we wish the Muslim world to regain its rightful place in world civilization. Today, any reasonably well-informed observer would be struck by how deeply this brotherhood of Muslims is divided. On the opposite sides of the fissures are the ultra-rich and the ultra-poor, the Shia and the Sunni, the theocracies and the secular states, the search for normatization versus the appreciation of pluralism, those who search for and are keen to adopt modern participatory forms of government versus those who wish to reimpose supposedly ancient forms of governance. What should have been brotherhood has become rivalry. Generosity has been replaced by greed and ambition. The right to think is held to be the enemy of real faith. And anything we might hope to do to expand the frontiers of human knowledge through research is doomed to failure. For in most of the Muslim world, there are neither the structures nor the resources to develop meaningful intellectual leadership. You will forgive me, I hope, for presenting to you such a gray picture of where we in the Ummah stand today. But unless we have the courage to face unpleasant reality, there is no way that we can aspire realistically to a better future. Several days ago at a meeting of the Organization of Islamic Conference in Malaysia, it was pointed out that the only way the Ummah can work its way out of its present sad state is to harness the intellect. I deeply share this conviction, but three immediate questions follow. How do we foster intellectual development in the Ummah? In what areas of human knowledge should we seek to lead? And where should we source our education? It is in an, in an endeavor to address such critical questions relating to education that the Ismaili Imamat has undertaken a number of initiatives. The Khan University was founded in Pakistan in 1983, and today its academic, academic activities radiate into Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and the United Kingdom. In 2001, an international treaty between the Ismaili Imamat and the republics of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan resulted in the establishment of the University of Central Asia, which aspires to impact the intelligentsia of the whole mountainous region of Central Asia with campuses in these countries. This university will study developmental issues specific to high mountain societies, while also offering courses in the humanities to promote respect for cultural pluralism and strengthen the foundations of civil society. Last year, I took the decision to launch a network of schools of excellence in the Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, Central Asia, and Southeast Asia, with the aim of educating young men and women up to the highest international standards from primary through higher secondary education. It is my hope that in due course, these schools will be late located in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Mozambique, Madagascar, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan, Syria, and in due course, Mali. 
Students and faculty will be encouraged to move through this school system, which of course will need to be residential, so that the graduates have been exposed to different social, ethnic, and religious environments, have become bilingual and perhaps trilingual, and will be equipped to lead in the professions in the societies in which they decide to establish themselves, whether or not they go to the best universities in their own countries or the best universities in the Western world. The students' areas of specialization will be in the fields of knowledge most required for the development of their societies, home countries and regions. But they will also have a strong grounding in the humanities, and in particular, the cultures of the Muslim world. They will be fully qualified in the use of modern information technologies, and thus, wherever they are, they will have easy and quick access to the world's most sophisticated knowledge bases, wherever they may be. The graduates' beliefs, practices, ethics, and social norms will be those of their own societies and their own cultures, and their value systems will be rooted in their own histories and their own arts. As these young, and women, young men and women grow into leadership positions in their own societies, including teaching future generations through their schools and universities, it is my hope that it will be these new generations of our intelligentsia who, driven by their own knowledge and their own inspiration, will change their own societies and will gradually replace many of the external forces who today appear and indeed sometimes seek to control our destinies. These young men and women will become leaders in the institutions of civil society in their own countries, in international organizations, and in all those institutions, academic, economic, and others, which cause positive change in our world. As more nations develop increasingly multicultural rather than uniform or monolithic profiles, and as the progress of globalization continues apace, educators are confronted by the challenge to provide to the mainstream population of their society an informed understanding of the culture and history of minorities domiciled in their midst, as well as other major civilizations beyond their shores. It must be said that in this respect, most of the countries of the West have been staggeringly slow to face up to this challenge, at least as far as Islam is concerned. The media and some opinion leaders tend, if not to actively perpetuate cliches and stereotypes, show a lack of anything like a nuanced knowledge or appreciation of the traditions of the Muslim world. School curricula in the humanities and social sciences are often formulated as if Islam did not exist or was not the religion and culture of a substantial portion of humanity. As a result, even a distant acquaintance with the world of Islam is nearly totally absent from the general knowledge of Western society. Undergraduate courses in universities, when describing and evaluating major achievements in the arts, sciences, philosophy, religion, and ethics, refer almost exclusively to figures in European or American history. Indeed, Islamic studies have been mostly relegated to the minute and often unheard minority of academics, of academic specialists in Western universities. In an effort to address these concerns, the Arkan Development Network is working closely with a number of leading North American universities and state educational authorities with a view to developing and implementing appropriate school curricula on Islam. In a related though separate initiative, the Ismaili Mamad is currently in the process of establishing a museum in Toronto 
as a significant resource for disseminating information and education about Islam's vast and varied heritage and its interface with the many cultures in which it has evolved. These and other initiatives, including the Institute of Ismaili Studies, are a continuation of the historic Ismaili tradition to promote knowledge and learning in line with the great ideals of Islam. To the graduates, past and present, I convey my very warm congratulations on this special day. I also wish you well in whatever careers you now choose to pursue. Among the options that you may consider are, for example, teaching at the Arkan University, particularly at the College of Arts and Sciences, when it opens its doors, inshallah, in 2007. At the University of Central Asia, or the Centers of Excellence at the Arkan Education Services are currently in the process of establishing. You may also find interest in the major teacher education program on which the Institute of Ismaili Studies is about to embark in the context of the secondary level curriculum that has been developed for the Jamaat. It is my hope and prayer that the education and training that you have acquired will enable you to assume positions of leadership in your communities, countries, and even beyond. I believe that your continuing relationship and dialogue with the Institute will enrich your role as potential agents of change, while also extending to the Institute the benefits of your experiences and insights. This partnership can ensure that you are well-placed to contribute to the development and growth of future generations of our intelligentsia so that we strengthen our own capacity to determine our own destiny. Thank you. Thank you, Your Highness. We now move to the formal awarding of the certificates to this year's graduating class. As the students take their positions, it gives me an opportunity to tell you that the students graduating today have completed two years at the Institute in which they have learned language skills, completed an internship, and attended classes taught by some of the best academics in the field. Upon completing their time with the IIS, they have just embarked on the next phase of this program. Within the group of 15 students, we have seven different countries represented and a variety of educational backgrounds. May I please request Your Highness to present the certificates. Our first graduate is from Portugal, has already completed his MA in Social Anthropology of Development at the School of Oriental and African Studies, and will be spending the next year in Mozambique working on an internship for the Aga Khan Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, Hussein Farouk Ali Sultan Ali Giga. The next graduate is from Canada, and she will be studying for her MSc in Social Anthropology at Oxford University. I am also very pleased to tell you that she is this year's valedictorian. Ladies and gentlemen, Sabrina Datu. Originally from Tajikistan and attending the London School of Economics this year, 
to study international banking law. Our next graduate is Osnora Dodekudoeva. currently studying social anthropology at the School of Oriental and African Studies, and originally from Pakistan, the next graduate is Shah Hussein. Jamil is from Canada and will be spending the next year at the London School of Economics, completing his MSc in Government and Politics. Jamil Jalal Jaffa. <laughs> Karim is originally from Iran and will be studying Middle Eastern and Islamic studies at the University of Cambridge. Karim Javan. <laughs> Originally from Tajikistan, and now at Sussex University to study international relations, please welcome Maruf Kandakov. now attending the London School of Economics where he is studying for his MSc in Environmental Policy, Planning and Regulation. Minaz is originally from India, Minaz Kerawala. Abid Khan, who is originally from Tajikistan, will be studying sociology at Oxford University. Abid Khan Kurban Konov. <laughs> Nagina, originally from Tajikistan, will study for her MSc in Health Services and Management at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Nagina Mirboz Konova. <laughs> the next graduate is originally from Iran and currently attending the School of Oriental and African Studies to complete her MA in Social Anthropology of Development. Ladies and gentlemen, Foyaze Mirshahi. <laughs> From Portugal and currently studying for her MSc in Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Edinburgh, our next graduate is Zora Pirbai. Sad Shaw, originally from Tajikistan, is studying international management at King's College London. Sad Shaw, Sad Shoev. <laughs> originally from China, Mayer Dan is studying for his MSc in Central Asian Politics at the School of Oriental and African Studies. Mayardan Shahidullah. <laughs> 
Finally, Muzaffar, originally from Tajikistan and now attending Warwick University to complete his MA in International Relations, Muzaffar Zolshoy. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the graduating class. Ever since its creation in 1977, one of the main goals of the Institute of Ismaili Studies has been the development of human resources. As part of our anniversary commemorations, we are very pleased that so many of our alumni have been able to join us from all over the world. Yesterday afternoon, we held an alumni reunion, which was a wonderful event. To tell us more about the alumni gathered here today and to honor them, I would like to call upon our alumni relations officer. A member of the alumni herself, having graduated from the IIS in 1997 after completing her Masters in Islamic Cultures and Societies. Ladies and gentlemen, may I please introduce my colleague and friend, Selina Qasim. Your Highness, members of the Board of Governors, faculty, alumni, students and distinguished guests. The Institute of Ismaili Studies has over the past two decades been involved in educating and preparing human resources in a variety of fields, both within and beyond the Ismaili Muslim community. To this end, four significant programs have been implemented and approximately 180 individuals have graduated from these programs. These men and women are a significant resource pool for the Jamaat, and a substantial number of them from these programs are making a contribution in either a voluntary or professional capacity in the IIS and other Jamaati institutions around the world. It is my great honor and pleasure to speak to you today about these programs and to honor the many alumni who have traveled from far and wide to be with us today. In 1982, the IIS sponsored 11 students to undertake an intensive course in advanced curriculum planning, followed by a special one-year diploma course in the development of instructional materials for Islamic education at the University of London's Institute of Education. These individuals then joined both the IIS and various Ismaili Tharika and religious education boards to undertake the writing of primary level religious education curriculum materials for Ismaili Muslim children globally. We are most pleased today to have seven of these individuals with us. May I kindly request these alumni to please rise and the audience to acknowledge them with a round of applause. Thank you. The year 1982 was also the first year of the Wisein and Teacher Education Program. This program was designed to equip students with the knowledge of the history and philosophy of the Ismaili Tariqa within the larger context of the Islamic tradition. Approximately 75 individuals from around the globe graduated from this training program. We are so happy to have 46 of them with us today. May I kindly request these alumni to please rise and the audience to honor them with a round of applause.
Thank you. The IIS collaborated with McGill University in Montreal on a joint program of study leading to McGill's MA degree in Islamic Studies. The program was concerned with the balanced study of Islam involving faith and culture throughout its history and geographical spread, recognizing the diverse dimensions and manifestations. It also attempted to understand how Muslims seek to deal with issues of concern to their societies and how they relate or seek to relate their heritage to the conditions of the modern world. There were approximately 15 students who were accepted into this program, and we are happy to have 13 of them with us today. May I request these graduates to kindly rise and the audience to honor them with a round of applause. Thank you. The current Human Resource Development Initiative of the Institute is the graduate program in Islamic Studies and Humanities, leading to a postgraduate degree from an accredited British university. The interdisciplinary approach to the program focuses on the faith, thought, and culture of Muslim societies in both historical and contemporary contexts. To date, we have had approximately 90 individuals go through this program, and we are happy to have 57 of those alumni with us today. I myself am a proud graduate of this program. May I request the past graduates to kindly rise and the audience to honor them with a round of applause. Your Highness, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for helping us to acknowledge and honor our alumni. Thank you, Selena. As is customary at graduations, each year the IIS picks one of the graduating class as the valedictorian. I am pleased to introduce this year's valedictorian, Sabrina Datu. Distinguished guests, good evening. I am honored to have been chosen to speak to you tonight, and I feel privileged to be speaking in the presence of His Highness the Aga Khan. I would like to begin, therefore, by offering my deep gratitude to you, Your Highness, and I'm sure I speak on behalf of many of us here tonight, our deep gratitude to you for your love, energy, and dedication to this community for your investment in the Institute of Smiley Studies and its graduates. Thank you. In November of 1977, the IAS was inaugurated here in London. A few months later, in January of 78, I was born <laughs> in Toronto to first-generation Canadians from Tanzania. My parents, raised with an acute awareness of the importance of education, came to Canada with one mantra on their lips, educate your children. So they both worked 10, 12, sometimes 13 hour days. They made the sacrifices and provided the love that enables me to stand here today with a university degree and a postgraduate certificate behind me. I want to acknowledge their never ending support and send them my love and thanks. Especially to
especially to my mom who just stood up. <laughs> Love you, thank you. Um, my parents went to Aga Khan schools and I the IAS. We are two generations intimately connected, connected to and guided by the modern institutions of the Ismaili Imamat. And as much as my parents were guided to seek sound education for their children, I feel that my generation has been guided to seek something for our global community. What is that something? I think this something involves finding a way for different people with varied histories, different ethnicities, and varied languages to live together in mutual recognition and peace. This is a challenge for all the world's communities, and it is a challenge for the Ismaili community insofar as it reflects global diversity. By way of my personal experiences at the IAS, I'd like to make a few remarks on the difficulties and rewards of accepting this challenge. When I first arrived in London, my first night, I was given a list of five names, fellow classmates who had already arrived. Now, till that point, most people I knew in my suburban Toronto universe had names drawn from a particular cache. Girls were Salima, Zara, Farah. Guys were Kareem, Rahim, Hussein. Last names were, for the most part, G names. Kanji, Manji, Damji, Shivji, Ramji, etc. So when I read the names Nagina Mirbos Khonova, Maruf Kandakov, Muzaffar Zulshoev, Obit Khan Kurban Khonov, and Sadshu Sadshoev, I was on unfamiliar ground. It's embarrassing now to admit my own ignorance, yet that feeling of puzzlement was my first small introduction to the larger historical and social differences indicated by names. Our names give some indication of the diversity of our class. We come from seven countries, Canada, China, India, Iran, Pakistan, Portugal, Tajikistan and between us speak at least 15 languages. Our nationalities are not enough to capture our diversity, for each of us has a special relationship to the region in which we were raised and to the first language which we speak, which isn't necessarily the language of the state in which we were raised. For example, I'm Canadian. I feel a stronger sense of belonging, however, to Toronto, Ontario than to say Quebec. My first language is Kachi, which I speak in addition to English and broken French. As we began a process of befriending, I learned that each one of us in this class has similarly layered senses of belonging. Yet we did at times transcend these local identities and unite in cooperative effort. The first classmate I met back at the hostel was Sadsho. I have no idea what he thought of me this Indian-looking creature who wasn't quite Indian, who insisted on engaging in idle chatter. Well, he introduced me to the others, and they took me on a nighttime tour of Hyde Park in the Trocadero. As we walked around, I think we felt at home in each other's company, complaining about London, reminiscing about our families. More students arrived at the hostel. One night found us huddled in Foyes' room, helping look for accommodation, a copy of a local paper distributed amongst us, and each person scanned a small section. We read the entries out loud between mugs of tea and friendly banter. Of course, this idyllic community didn't last for two years. I'm not sure that it made it much past two weeks, actually. Nonetheless, it was a formative experience for me. It resonated with the visions of society with which I was raised. And it was a concrete experience that suggested that something like unity and diversity is possible. My firm belief in that possibility was, however, tested over the next two years. 
Our classroom discussions were often tense. Differing ideologies, differing visions of the good life, emerged in competition. I was naively surprised that my classmates weren't singing the praises of North American feminism as I had been raised to. Instead, we clamored to contribute varied personal experiences and defend contrasting points of view. Those heated discussions were perhaps part of a process of coping with our differences. And I don't think I could have learned in Canada that building these friendships requires conscious effort and hard work. Our class for two years oscillated between moments of unity and moments of melting away into separate communities. Yet I want to raise the point that the last two years have been remarkable precisely because of trying to maintain these peculiar friendships. This befriending process has entailed difficulty, yet it has also thrown up moments of joy, moments of learning, and that is what I will value most from my time at the Institute. I think we as a class should be proud of trying to build friendships across the boundaries of ethnicity, language, and history. It is my hope that the classes after us continue in this tradition, and it is my hope that the Institute continues to invest in this tradition, a tradition of building friendships, in addition to investing in our intellectual growth. An investment in the social life of students at the Institute is a precious thing, since the friendships made here may likely build the foundation of the tolerant, cosmopolitan, global community that we envision for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings to an end the formal proceedings. I would like, however, once, once again to take this opportunity to thank you all very much indeed on behalf of everybody at the IIS for taking the time to be here with us today, for joining with us on this happy occasion, and for playing your part in the Institute's past 25 years and, inshallah, in the next 25 years. May I ask you to please rise as the chairman and the members of the board leave the hall.